so this is the first public workshop open to the UBC community to come and learn about the various Indigenous strategic plan toolkits. And it, we are, you are being hosted this morning by the Office of Indigenous Strategic Initiatives or acronym OISI, O-I-S-I. And our office has developed this set of tools which individual units or faculties or initiatives can use to help situate themselves in relation to Indigenous engagement and to begin aligning your own work with the Indigenous Strategic Plan. And joining us this morning for the workshop, we have my colleague, Adrian Bedan, who's Senior Advisor to the Deputy Vice Chancellor and Principal on Indigenous Affairs in the Okanagan. We also have Vicki George, Associate Director with the Office of Indigenous Strategic Initiatives, and Jesse Penner, Administrative Coordinator with the Office of Indigenous Strategic Initiatives. Now, the ISP uh, is intended to be our guide at UBC for meaningful reconciliation, to help make meaningful reconciliation a priority for all of us, students, faculty, and staff. And it is our document that provides core guidance to the entire institution, all, all areas of the university on our Indigenous engagement for the coming years. And to the best of our knowledge, we are the first university in North America and actually most of the world to make explicit commitments to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And what the toolkit and the action plan do is help move that commitment to implementation because that is actually where the importance uh, and the immense importance of the ISP action plan takes hold. So what we're going for and aiming for is that all Indigenous students, faculty, staff across the institution will meet an environment here where they feel valued, respected, and in which they have an opportunity to thrive. Now we could spend an entire hour just on this slide uh, about the positioning of the UN Declaration with the Indigenous Strategic Plan, but I wanna go just over a couple key background points very quickly. So the question is, why do we ground the ISP in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples? Quite simply, we do this for a couple of reasons. The UN Declaration, is the bare minimum international standard of Indigenous peoples' human rights. It's a global consensus document that was negotiated for over two decades between Indigenous peoples' representatives and UN member states. Here in Canada, when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission released its final report in June of 2015, which included its 94 calls to action, it positioned adoption and implementation of the UN Declaration explicitly as the, the framework to meaningful reconciliation in Canada. The ISP, the Indigenous Strategic Plan, is the translation of those international Indigenous human rights into our everyday lives and work in post-secondary space. So a few core principles, rules of thumb, as it were, that can guide our work in putting the UN Declaration into daily practice in our lives and our work include the following. Acknowledging and supporting Indigenous self-determination. Creating an atmosphere of mutual respect, reciprocity, collaboration, co-development, and co-governance wherever possible. And maintaining relational approaches grounded in ongoing discussion and negotiations. And at this point, I'm going to turn over to my colleague, Adrian Bedan, who will take over the next slide. Hello and good day, everyone. Uh, I'm joining you today uh, from the Okanagan campus, uh, which is located in the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Seal people. Um, it's really exciting uh, to think of uh, the new uh, network model that has been created for ISP implementation. 
Uh, and this implementation structure is relational and distributed to allow for a collective response and responsibility across both campuses, as well as accountability at all levels. Everyone is responsible for implementing the ISP. This model has an Indigenous-led advisory and implementation committees with Indigenous faculty, students, and staff at decision-making tables from across both campuses. Uh, and through um, these two new committees that have been created, uh, the ISP Executive Advisory Committee and ISP Coordinating Committee, uh, Indigenous people are at decision-making uh, making tables uh, which hasn't happened before uh, through committee structures at UBC. It's also really uh, exciting to know that units and portfolios from both campuses are engaging with the ISP toolkit. And from the Okanagan campus, uh, this includes the ADP students, School of Social Work, and the Graduate Student Advisory Council and more. I'll now pass it over uh, to Vicki George, uh, who's going to provide a background of the ISP. Thanks, Adrian. Okay, so the ISP background, that's our acronym uh, short for Indigenous Strategic Plan, the ISP background. It actually started back when I was an undergrad student uh, around uh, around those years of 2009, I'll say that. And we uh, came up with the ISP framework and we, um, it was the input of Indigenous students at that time and uh, also faculty and staff about our realities on campus here at Vancouver. Since this time, there have been significant philosophical shifts and national awakening to the critical work of the reconciliation. This includes the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report and the 94 Calls to Action, and the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Inquiry report and its 231 Calls for Justice. Around October, 2017 to June 2018, the updated ISP framework developed. In June 2019, Board of Governors adopts the vision and mission statements in the Indigenous Strategic Plan. September 2019, the UBC Okanagan introduced their Declaration of Truth and Reconciliation Commitments, committing to five recommended actions towards reconciliation. And then, for those of you that might have been lucky enough to see this live uh, virtually during a pandemic, the ISP launched in September 2020. The, and this was the UBC's response to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Report and Vancouver's response to the TRC. This plan is the result of more than 2,500 unique engagements. And yes, I was around those engagement tables for each one, and it was an honor and privilege hearing the voices of Indigenous students, faculty, and staff. And also over 15,000 ideas, opinions, and comments shared by Indigenous and non-Indigenous individuals across both campuses and with our Indigenous community partners. The feedback received was collated and analyzed and ultimately culminated in the eight goals and 43 actions. And I will pass this over to Jesse. Thanks, Vicki. Uh, so this diagram is a starting point and just a snapshot of the vast network of relationships. Uh, it is crucial that UBC recognizes and attends to each one of our relationships within this network in purposeful and meaningful ways. Uh, our nearest relationships and responsibilities are with our host nations um, of Musqueam and the Okanagan Nation Alliance or ONA with whom we have a deepening and formalized relationship uh, as expressed through a memorandum of affiliation uh, with Musqueam and a memorandum of understanding with the ONA. Um, again, this is just a snapshot uh, and our relationships are always growing um, and are very important to us and are uh, in, as our principles, they are 
um, it's important that we continue building relationships and upkeeping these. Um, I'm going to move on to talk about the ISP implementation model. Uh, this is a new innovative network model for ISP implementation support, as uh, my colleague Adrian uh, did mention. Uh, the model has embed Indigenous-led advisory and implementation committees uh, and inserted Indigenous people at the decision-making tables where they have historically been excluded from. And this has been done through the creation of two new committees, the Indigenous Strategic Plan Executive Advisory Committee and the Indigenous Strategic Plan Coordinating Committee. Uh, both committees have begun their work and are well underway in advancing the ISP. Um, we want to emphasize that everyone has a shared responsibility for advancing the ISP. It's not just the responsibility of those working on the Indigenous portfolio any longer to do this work at UBC. Um, our implementation model is both dialogical and relational. It's not expected that units Sorry, it's expected that units respect these principles. Um, the model is not a box ticking exercise, um, nor is it prescriptive. Each portfolio, faculty and unit will align with the ISP in their own uh, individual ways. Um, units do not need to include every ISP goal and action, but should rather focus on where the unit can have the most impact. Thanks, Jesse. So the ISP implementation advice, there are numerous points across both campuses where units can seek advice on the ISP implementation. We have the Indigenous Advisory Committee at the Okanagan. It considers the current state of Indigenous activities on UBC's Okanagan campus, identifies priority areas of focus for the future, and helps implement strategies to advance these initiatives. The Indigenous Strategic Plan Implementation Committee at the Vancouver campus devises and monitors implementation strategies and advises administration on the allocation of resources uh, pulled off from the Indigenous portal. Uh, this, you can, you can look at the Indigenous portal for more information about the ISPIC committee. The Office of Indigenous Strategic Initiatives, or what we call ourselves OIC, was created in February 2021 to coordinate the implementation of UBC's 2020 Indigenous Strategic Plan across Vancouver and Okanagan campuses. The Indigenous Strategic Plan Executive Advisory Committee identifies ISP priorities, reviews implementation progress, and provides recommendations on funding priorities projects and programs and is made up of Indigenous and non-Indigenous UBC staff, faculty and students across both campuses. I will move on to the visual representation of the ISP guiding network. So this you can find on our ISP website. Through this graphic, we seek to demonstrate the accountability across all levels that the ISP is to be implemented through. At the bottom of the graphic, we begin with the various faculties, departments, and units at UBC that collect data, implement day-to-day -day happenings, and make decisions. Above this, we have three committees, ISPIC, IAC, and at the Vancouver campus, and the IAC at the Okanagan campus who collect data, provide recommendations and advice on the UBC Indigenous portfolios. Both of these committees also feed updates into iSpeak, which has representatives from across both campuses. iSpeak advises, reviews, and provides recommendations on ISP priorities and progression. Going a level above, we have the Indigenous Strategic Plan Coordinating Committee or the ISPCC, which has representatives from the executive leadership, including President Santa Ono and our senior advisors on the in Indigenous Affairs. ISPCC is the decision-making body centric on the ISP priority goals, actions, and funding. Their decisions are made centered on the 
input of iSpeak and the information provided to them. The ISPCC is accountable to our Board of Governors and noting the Board Indigenous Engagement Committee who has the role of ensuring that the university pursues the goals set forward in the Indigenous Strategic Plan and in that adequate resources are directed towards its fulfillment. The ISPCC also feeds up to the Senate as well. Together, the Board and Senate have oversight, resource allocation, and academic and policy direction on the ISP. This is an important slide. Uh, we get asked quite a bit about what the similarities and differences are between the ISP and equity, diversity, and inclusion. This is a very important question that's asked and I'm, I'm actually pleased that people are wanting to understand this better. The implementation of the ISP seeks to amplify Indigenous voices to bring about structural and innovative change that remedy the colonial experience in Canada. For instance, there's no other group in Canada that has the Indian Act from 1876 to the present day. As such, meaningful reconciliation moves beyond EDI work and requires the acknowledgement of Indigenous people's distinctive histories, experiences, and lived realities associated with and impacted by colonialism, and as an example, the Indian Act. We are moving in the same direction. ISP implementation emphasizes collaboration, collectivity, and coordination. Thanks, Vicki. I will chat about the implementation toolkit and workshops. Um, so the next few slides are going to take us through ISP implementation uh, toolkits, which OIC developed to guide units and faculties in the implementation of the ISP in their own individual contexts. Uh, the first step of our toolkit is the ISP self-assessment tool. The self-assessment tool provides a space for your unit or faculty to have conversations about Indigenous engagement and reconciliation with specific focus on where your, where your unit is currently doing well and where your opportunities are for improvement. Um, it's a chance for your unit to collectively reflect on the systems of colonialism at UBC and situate yourselves in relation to the ISP. Uh, the tool is broken into 35 questions across five thematic areas, uh, understanding people, culture and systems, relationships and partners, and teaching, learning, and research. Uh, the first four thematic areas are for all units and faculties, uh, no matter their role at UBC. And the final area, the teaching, learning, and research area, is just for academic units and faculties. Uh, the ISP implementation toolkit is, provides an opportunity for units to slow down and reflect. As such, this self-assessment tool will take a number of sessions uh, to get through, but the results will be extremely useful for both the general understanding in your unit, as well as the next steps in the ISP implementation process. Uh, the results of the tool are for your unit's use only. It's not a reporting mechanism or for external use. Just going to change slides here. Um, so further talking about the toolkit. Uh, between ISP touch points and the use of both toolkits, uh, OISE has reached upwards of 1,200 plus individuals across UBC so far. Uh, the self-assessment and intent to action toolkits have been conducted with various offices across UBC, uh, including UBC Sustainability, the AVP students at the Okanagan campus, uh, the School of Public Policy and the President's Office, just to highlight a few. Uh, we have impact stories on the new ISP website. Um, where you can see where we showcase successes and lessons learned from various departments on their journeys implementing the ISP and their experiences with the ISP toolkits. 
Uh, as you may know, the new Indigenous Strategic Initiatives Fund has recently launched. And for streams one and two, the applicants must do the self-assessment tool uh, before applying to slow down and reflect on how their ideas relate to the ISP goals and actions. Uh, to read more about other units' experiences with the toolkits, please visit isp.ubc.ca and view impact stories. Uh, we host stories from units that have uh, successfully gone through the toolkits, including uh, one from USI up right now. Um, and they were one of the first units to do both the self-assessment toolkit and the intent to action toolkit. Uh, and if you have conducted the toolkit and want to share your experience, please reach out to oic.admin.ubc.ca if you'd like to share a story. And we'll move on to the intent to action toolkit, uh, which is the second toolkit. Um, this tool picks up from where the ISP self-assessment tool takes you and starts to take you on your lessons learned and trans transform uh, them into action in your unit. Uh, so you must complete the self-assessment tool to then move on to the intent to action. Uh, this tool provides a logic framework for breaking down, um, sorry, for breaking down the ISP goals and actions and mapping them onto your unit's specific mission, vision, values, and strategies. Uh, there are three workshops as part of the intent to action toolkit. Um, the first two focus on a core planning team, and the final one opens up to unit-wide engagement. By the end of the three workshops, your unit will have a plan of action as to how to implement the specific uh, ISP, uh, ISP specific um, goals and actions into your own context. Uh, it's not expected that you will choose all eight goals and 43 actions of the ISP, of course, uh, but rather the tool helps you focus on where your unit can have the greatest impact. So we also have another tool um, called our Sample Performance Measurement Framework. Um, this is the third tool. This PMF provides just a sample of outputs, ink, outcomes, and performance measures for each of the 43 actions in the ISP. Uh, these can be used by units and faculties to evaluate ISP-related projects and initiatives. These outputs, uh, outcomes, and performance measures are really just for guidance um, to provide units with examples of how progress can be measured. Uh, units are free to use whichever indicators they feel are most appropriate to their own content context. So again, this is not prescriptive. This is just to give you a general idea. So I'm going to hand it off to Vicki for our overview. Thanks, Jesse. The Indigenous Strategic Plan is a path-breaking plan, first of its kind in North America. Faculties and units can align with the plan where they see the opportunity for greatest impact. Therefore, we understand that you're not gonna get all of the eight goals and 43 action items done in the first year. This is a long game and it's going to take time. And those goals and actions you can utilize and figure out after you've done the toolkit, both, both sections of them, the self-assessment tool and the int intent to action tool will better uh, be able to show you how effective you can be in your unit or faculty with the specific goals and actions uh, that pertain to your particular experience. There are multiple points across both campuses where advice on ISP implementation can be sought. Toolkit focuses on process rather than outputs. Let me say that again. The toolkit focuses on process rather than outputs. Slow down. This is an opportunity when you go through the toolkit where you can have discussion and dialogue that has never happened at UBC before. This is the opportunity. And frankly, I've been in the ISP toolkit sessions with folks and the slowing down happens organically because folks share their experiences, feedback, 
and answers when they go through the toolkit. Pushback is inevitable. Yes, that might happen, but thoughtful and meaningful reconciliation takes time. And in closing, we often get asked, what can we do? Well, this is the start, the Indigenous Strategic Plan and the Implementation Toolkit. The ISP Toolkit is based upon ISP's three foundational documents, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission Report and its 94 calls to action, the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Inquiry Report and its 231 calls for justice, and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. We created and worked on the toolkits for you. This is a good place to start. By reading and reviewing the UBC Indigenous Strategic Plan in its entirety and the ISP toolkit that includes the self-assessment tool and the intent to action tool, these will provide your faculty or unit with the guidance to implement the ISP that's unique to your faculty and unit needs. This work may be tough at times, but it is necessary. If you think about why there's 94 actions from the TRC report and why there's 231 actions from the inquiry report, and then let that sink in about why there's so many actions that are specifically directed towards indigenous people and why we need a human rights recognized and affirmed via the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, then this is proof of the urgency of this work. If you have any questions, please reach out to the Office of Indigenous Strategic Initiatives at oic.admin at ubc.ca. Thank you.